A lovely morning to you all and welcome to Faceless Fears, the live event where we aim to understand and tackle reasons and possible solutions to the current rise in depression, anxiety, and suicide among teens and youth globally. My name is Biancha Nicole and I am your host for today. Thank you so much for tuning in today because we have a lovely array of segments lined up from entertainment to panel discussions to question and answer interactive sessions as well as therapeutic activity. Feel free to interact with our social media that is at Slam Code Group on Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn as well as Slam Code TV on YouTube. Without further ado, allow me to introduce the first performance of the day by Rema Band. They will be produced, performing sorry, <laughs> a beautiful cover of Moving On by Asha. Karibuni sana.
Hi, and welcome back to Faceless Fears. Welcome to the question and answer interactive session with our panelists. I am joined by six lovely panelists with me here and one of the gents. We're going to be having a very interactive uh, question and answer session based on the motive of the event, for Faceless Fears, offering solutions to combating depression, suicide, and anxiety among the youth globally. I'll allow the panelists to introduce themselves. We also have one joining in all the way from Hong Kong, so we're super excited. Uh, I'll allow them to introduce themselves before we can proceed. Karibu Nisana. We can start with, with Carol. Hello, everyone. I'm Carol uh, Murugi. I'm a psychology student at Maseno University. Um, I'm also a peer educator at SOS Children's Villages, Nairobi. And uh, I also, I'm also an intern at the Children's Office, Kamukunji. Yeah, and I'm glad. It's nice to have you here too. Yeah. Hi everyone, my Hi. name is Clara Marie. I'm a young entrepreneur. Um, yeah, I'm a mental health advocate, founder of Stay Grey a mental health brand that aims at giving people sanity and helping them see the neutrality of our life. Thank you. Hi, Nicole. Hi. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Bini Brambhar Sharma. I'm a social entrepreneur. My life's purpose is to understand, listen, engage with teenagers. And in a nutshell, I'm a teen mentor. I'm also a columnist uh, with a local magazine here writing on teen mental health. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Hello. My name is Aruna Varsani. I'm a founder of Together for Better, but today I'm here representing my educational field, which has come from my Montessori uh, education part. So I'm a director at Montessori Plus Center. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hello. I'm Paul Obat, founder and president of Chanuka Association. I am a community development officer and a social worker. I also work with young people to empower them. And Ms. Serena, can you see us? <laughs> yes, I can, yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Serena from Hong Kong and I am the founder of Care Bear here where we advocate for teenagers who have depression. And so what we do is we incorporate technology with a human touch in an interactive app and the care box service to be peer support among youth with depression. And on top of that, my day job is in clinical and research in psychology and counseling. Nice to be here. Thank you, it's so nice to have you here. Uh, without further ado, we can get right into the conversation. Um, I'd like to start with Ms. Bini. You are a teen mentor. Um, I mean, at the moment, we can see what COVID is doing to us in all aspects, mentally, physically, spiritually. It's, it's crazy. And being a teen mentor, we can see how difficult it is for the youth right now. And as age, you know, before we used to think it was probably youth aged between 25 to 30, but now as kids as young as nine are going through a lot at the moment. So how would you say, how do you think best we can address the stigma that surrounds mental health as from being lazy and unproductive and irresponsible to more of, listen, this is stemming from something. It is not just mere irresponsibility, but there's a root to what it is that is happening. Thank you, thank you. This is, this is such a fundamental question. How? How do we dig deeper? How do we dive deeper into the whole psychological aspect of children between the age of 9 and 19? The fundamental question is why? Why are we seeing the youth of today self-harming? Why are we seeing the youth of today uh, having suicidal ideation? Why are uh, the cases of depression and anxiety uh, highest than ever before? And the reason from my understanding, my perspective, my experience, is that there is a huge gap today in the way the society, the community, the educators, the parents, uh, the way we perceive adolescence versus what is actually going on in their headspace. So allow me a little bit of time to share what's going on. 
right? Definitely. Um, if you look at the neuroscience perspective, the prefrontal cortex, that's, that's the decision-making part of our brain. This is the, the CEO of our brain, the rational thinking part of our brain. Take a guess today in, in my fellow panelists and everyone here, by what age would that be completely developed? 25. So if your rational thinking part of your brain completely develops at the age of 25, you can only imagine that the adolescents of today, the preteens of today, are working majorly from the emotional part of the brain, the amygdala. And that's why their impulsive behavior, that's why they're acting in, acting out. And yet, sadly, this is also the time, the age of 10, 11, 12, 13, is essentially the time when they hit puberty. So there is the whole hormonal imbalance going on. There's the whole neuroscience going on. And then there is this whole community of parents, teachers, educators, who are probably attached to the grades. The education system, which is still about 200 years old, haven't changed yet, but the world has changed completely for our adolescents. They can get whatever information by, the, by their fingertips. So there is a huge gap in the way we look at them versus what they are going through. There's a whole chaos going within. And they are lacking a safe space, essentially a safe space where they can be who they want to be, without judgments, without toxic expectations without comparisons. We have to remind ourselves as a community, as parents, as educators, that grades are not who we are. Grades are where we are on that day. So the exam pressures, the school pressures, the peer pressure, the social comparisons, right? The Instagram stuff, the validation. And I can go on and on and on, and I think the whole R will be gone in that. But in a nutshell, if you now understand what they are going through, we have to walk on this space with compassion. We have to become that nine-year-old or a 13-year-old or a 17-year-old or a 15-year-old and understand what they are going through. So if you see a child who is acting out or acting in, it's our job to dig deeper and ask them why. In my experience, I have seen that there's not a single kid who is lazy. There's not a single kid who is irresponsible. What they are lacking is the motivation. What they are lacking is that spark. And then this entire pandemic has taken a whole new toll on their mental health. So to me, fundamentally, four A's. Attention, affection, appreciation, and acceptance. This is our our fundamental need as human, as children. So as long as we are giving these four A's and we step away from comparison and judgment and toxic expectations and provide a safe space, I think there is a little bit of chance that we will try giving them that safe space and, and mitigating this gap that has been created between their generation and ours. That 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 is extremely important. I mean, to think that... I have been making decisions purely based on emotion. But, and I, I really think, oh, I am super intelligent for making this. This has taken so much brain for me to make this decision. And it is purely emotion. But again, I think it also, um, from just the way you said, the four A's, right now with everything that's happening, we do understand it's parents are stressed out. Parents are extremely stressed out, trying to make ends meet. It becomes so difficult for them to be able to provide those essential um, fundamental needs for a child because you're going to tell them, listen, I'm feeding you every day. You're living in this house. There's nothing more that, there's nothing more that you need. I mean, people have it worse out there. So it becomes extremely difficult for... I, th I think it becomes difficult for parents to be able to tap into the emotional needs of a child and so it, it becomes extremely, it, it cancels out. It's, it's frustrating it, because just like you've said, I mean, comparison, 
you're going to be told, you're having a call, maybe over dinner with your parents and you're sitting and you're listening to them talking about how this family has it worse than us, this family has it, uh, are struggling more than us. And while all that is true, emotionally, I don't think that should suffice. I mean, just because I have a roof over my head, I don't think it's necessarily fair for me to have my emotional needs neglected and then called out for responding the way that I do because of lack thereof. It's and, and in a situation where you are to probably engage with a parent on that, how do you think you would bring it up Interesting. For me, um, personally, um, in my perspective, I think if we can work only on the space of parents, a lot can be resolved. And how do we do that? So um, fundamentally, we have to break it down. We have to share with them that when we are talking about their safe space, even as people, we don't have our safe space. Right. And that's why you see sometimes full-fledged adults are are just passing around as as, you know, people ready to be erupted. That's why we have misplaced anger, because we don't have our safe space. We can't speak our truth without worrying about judgment. So what I share with parents is that try to have your dining table conversations without your gadgets. Try to have conversations which is less about how was school and what grades did you get and why someone got this and why someone's looking that way. And try to be in your own lane, in your own bubble, and talk about out-of-the-box things. Talk about uh, why uh, would, uh, what do you think would it be if a cat was pink in color? Mm -hmm. Something funny and it just immediately got everyone smiling, right? Play games, engage more. Um, most importantly, stay away from anything that seems like you're cornered. And step away from the idea of perfection. So I think for parents, they can actually turn it around and turn it into their safe space. Imagine if you could come home and share with your child, hey, I had such a terrible day at work. I, I had a setback. I failed today. Why do we always have to talk about our past failures? Past. Why can't we talk about our failures today? Because one, you are getting your safe space. You're being who you are. You're sharing exactly what you went through. So the child is like, oh my God, my mom had a tough day. My dad had a tough day. And you're also giving a message that we are imperfect beings. And it's beautiful to be the way we are. And you're also telling your child to, that it's OK. You don't always have to get it all yeah. right. And in times of pandemic, to, to each of us, to all of us, we have to remind ourselves that as long as we are waking up and we are doing our best every day in this moment, we are going to be OK. Unfortunately, our thinking mind takes us right from the future to the past, to the future to the past. It, it does not allow us to be in this moment. In this moment where all of us are here looking pretty, talking, we're okay. It's just about coming back to the present moment. So when you break it down to the parents where it's never that serious, it's just about doing your best but being authentic. You know, allowing yourself the failure, allowing yourself to, to be a story, share your embarrassing stories, laugh, joke about it, and next day is a new day. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you so much, Bini. Um, and I think something that I've picked up from that is even during these conversations, it's genuine listening. Have When you're having conversations, you're genuinely listening. You're not listening to give a response or give a reply or call someone out or criticize. It's genuine. It's coming from the heart. And I think that is also a skill that most of us might think we have, but... It's, it's something that we choose to develop, choose to be very intentional about. Um, moving, moving a bit uh, aside from that, I mean, we do have mental, our mental health advocates here, Ms. Carolyn and Ms. Cla Ms. Marie, sorry. <laughs> Based with, with whatever is happening, I mean, it's, it's very common and you might think this is cliche, why would you ask this? But it exists. And so what are some, what would you say are some of the challenges during the pandemic that would lead to the spiral of, or then the increase in numbers of people falling into depression and anxiety and just digging deep into that black hole? Because in as much as we say, you know, mental health exists, depression exists, um, anxiety exists, 
there has to be a root, I believe, and some of these are fueled by some of the challenges that uh, we're facing currently. So would you like to expand on that? Who, who would like to go first? <laughs> OK, I think I can go first. Thank you. So since the pandemic, uh, so much has happened. And people had many expectations since the pandemic. You know, like the virus maybe still didn't stay for long. And uh, people, even students, maybe they thought uh, they will just continue with their studies and everything will go on as normal. But there's just so much that has happened. Um, the social distancing, we have to wear masks. Uh, people have lost their jobs. You know, it's a lot and it's overwhelming. So these are the causes of the anxiety and they are the ones that lead to people even committing suicide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially students, don't you think? As p students in their final year who are sure they were going to venture out, they were going to clear, and now this, I mean. <laughs> yeah, exactly. People are in a bubble, as I, as I can say. But what really triggers the anxiety is, I really think that the youths and the teenagers they had problem with the self-esteem and self-discovery. And going outside was a scapegoat for them. But when we had this pandemic, you, you're in your homes, locked down, and then you just come to your personal space. All the demons that were running on your mind are coming to, um, coming to existence. Now you just keep on thinking about them. You just keep on thinking, thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, low self-esteem, am I good enough, am I worth it, am I doing things that are going to make me better? Those are the things that you're now thinking since you're in a bubble, you're locked down, and you don't have anyone to talk to at the time, that that time you're locked in your houses. Mm -hmm. I think this pandemic has really injured a lot of people because I can't testify that I also had mental issues and I'm not ashamed of that because I've come to you grow shouldn't. out of those kind of issues and I'm really grateful. And I think that people should really take a tour on themselves, have a journey of self-discovery. Who am I? Who do I want to be? How can I take this pandemic as something that can make me great? Lisa Nichols once said that your convictions and convenience don't live in the same block. Your convictions are your passions. And your convenience, conveniences are those things that make you comfortable. So this pandemic has come as an inconvenience. Now, take that inconvenience into better use. Don't lie down and say you are done, you are worthless. No, you're not. This is just an inconvenience. And I can testify it's something that you can build something big out of it. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you for sharing a personal story. I mean, it's it's not easy for anyone to come on live, um, have a live session and tell people, you know what, I'm struggling with this and this without either seeming to look for something in return or just be afraid. And it's true. The pandemic is a complete inconvenience. Yes, it is. Uh, whether we like it or not i mean people will have conversations and tell you oh you know i'm in one way or the other profiting from covid i mean if you have a business that is complementary to the pandemic you're making billions and that's not a lie but just like the way you said i mean right now for some people who had different ways of choosing to ignore or not really ignore but escape what it is that they're going through they found it outside yeah. but now the universe has said no we're going through this and you're going to go back to the same place that you were trying to escape yeah. and you're going to have to deal with it and what becomes difficult is sometimes I don't even know what it is that I'm dealing with I don't even understand what it is that I'm dealing with and so how am I supposed to address it but like just like Marie has said it's it's an inconvenience we can get 
around it. And one of the ways we can get around it is through a session like this, because I mean, I'm pretty sure you didn't know your rational thinking begins at 25. So <laughs> you learn something new every day. <laughs> but uh, if, if I can, yeah, if I can just say it's, it's frustrating, it's, it's sad, it's exhausting. And now it's looking you right in the face. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to deal with me? Because you cannot necessarily get rid of me. And if, if I can just use a, a bit of um, experience that I've had from even friends. I have friends who are living in extremely toxic environments at the moment. And for one reason or another, I mean, it's, you don't even know what to do. Everything around you is so toxic that you do not even have time to yourself. You're constantly dealing with what it is that is around you. How would you, how would you say you could get around something like that? Because I don't think you can just wake up in the morning and say, I am going to have a positive day. You are going to have a positive day, but your situations might not want the same for you. And you just have to constantly keep trying. So how would you, wh what do you do from there? Can I, can I share some Kindly. insights on that? So it's interesting because yesterday I was listening to this podcast from Brené Brown um, and what she shares was, was the guest on her show was sharing this, that this, what you just shared, that we wake up and we can't suddenly one fine morning say, okay, now I have to be positive. This is it. No, that's, that's toxic positivity because we are trying to now put a carpet on our emotions and move on. Right. And that's where we are bottling our emotions. So one of the things I would share with all um, youth and and adolescents is emotions are your signposts. So think of it this way. You're walking on a road and there's a signpost and you look and you say, hmm, is this where this is going? How about you start now labeling those emotions? Right. So when, like you said, we have so many different emotions. OK, but if I were to ask us to name them, usually they are just three or four. OK, so we have to go and unravel those. We have to go and make it granular. We have to actually now say sad is just not sad. Sad is what? Am I angry? Am I hurt? Am I irritated? Am I annoyed? Am I frustrated? Am I overwhelmed? So one of the things I, I do myself, because as, as a mentor, as somebody who's doing her master's in psychology, I get overwhelmed, mm -hmm. right? So what I do is, and I make my mentees do, is do a brain dump. So just like mind mapping, you write brain dump, beneath brain dump, and then you mind map and say overwhelmed, angry, frustrated, tired, exhausted, burnout. Whatever comes to your mind, write it. Now those are your signposts. Now, in each of those, dig deeper and ask yourself, why am I feeling overwhelmed? Have I overscheduled? Am I working too hard? Can I ask for help? Can I be vulnerable and say that I am tired, guys? I can't do this anymore. Can you help me? Right now, the moment you start doing that, this is the space, as I call it, you're inhaling. As people, we are always exhaling. We're always out. We're always out. We always want everything external. Okay, we want others to solve our problem. We want to blame people. But when you are inhaling, you are in that space where, like she said, we are self-discovering. So use your emotions as your signpost, I would say. That would be the starting point. Go deeper with it and see what comes up. Thank you. Thank you. And, and that can be used for everyone, really. You can, it's, it's for, ev for parents. Uh, for the youth, I mean, you can even get a little child, you know, to you tell you. You can use it as a family bonding. Exactly. I do that. I ask parents to sit around dining table and spend 15 minutes after dinner just, just doing this, just sharing. Let's label our emotions. Let's label why we are feeling the way we are feeling. Right? Let's even spell those emotions. It's fun. That that's super important. I mean, I hadn't thought of that. It's it's a great way to you know bring bonding and communication and just still maintain the togetherness of a family and making it fun without having to to shed tears. Because if I speak from a personal experience, I hate crying, and I hate people seeing me cry. So if if I'm sitting there, 
and during you know family discussion and we're talking about our days and something triggers um, um, tears I'm backing out I you, I think it's also probably just a, a coping mechanism uh, a response but again with the responsibilities that we have I'd, I'd say even as a firstborn um, there's a lot that's expected from you, from your parents. And if you have younger siblings, there's a lot that's expected from you. You need to be almost like a pillar in some sort. And just like you said, I, I am a human being. I am experiencing constant emotions. I have what it is that I'm dealing with on my end, which might not look like a big deal to the family because, you know, if, if, if you speak to your parents and you tell them, oh, you know, I'm going through this and this, there's two sides they will either understand and be like, okay, listen, it might not make sense to me, but I respect what it is that you're going through. Or it can now switch to, what do you mean? I mean, there's so many other things to be worried about. You don't even know if you're going to have a meal on the table the next day and you choose to be complaining about A, B, and C. And sadly, that is how a lot of the conversations go between parents and children previously and now it has definitely skyrocketed because everyone is frustrated, everyone is stressed out. And um, if, if I can move a bit more, uh, Mr. Paul, you mentioned that you are the founder of Chanuka Association and you've been able to hold almost four conferences to, that deal with, with um, drug and substance abuse. But um, before I can get to that, were we, I'm, I'm recently finding out about this and I'm learning that there is a penal code for attempted suicide, the Kenyan law. So if, you, if one was to attempt suicide, there is the possibility of being jailed and it's up to a two-year term. Can we, can we have a bit of a conversation about that? Because... It's, it doesn't make sense to me. Can I shed some light? Kindly. Uh, it's interesting because it's, it's, I didn't know about this. And it is, it is ruthless. And I'll share why. Because even when I was growing up and we would hear about um, suicide, uh, I heard my parents say that it's such a cowardly thing to do. And my parents are educated. I, I'd be like, I believed that, it's such a cowardly thing to do. How could you kill yourself? How can something not be, how can there be no solution? How could you give up on yourself, right? However, now with my studies and my experiences and my knowledge and, and the reading that I'm doing is, it's, it's, it's not that. It's just that if somebody who's dealing with depression, let me, let me share a statistic. 90% and above of the deaths committed by suicide are coming from people who are suffering with depression. 90% and above. That also means that depression is not feeling depressed. Okay, I may be feeling depressed today, but that does not mean I have depression. Depression is feeling sad, really sad, having that feeling of darkness. Even when you may be on the top of your food chain, maybe you're the most successful person, maybe you are a seven A star student, but you feel so hollow and empty within, it comes from your gut to your brain, where you don't feel there's anything worth, worth smiling about or being happy about, right? That feeling goes on for at least minimum of two weeks at a stretch. And then you start feeling a little bit better and then again, now that is depression. Now, you have to remember, it's less to do about a person, it's more to do with the way your brain is wired. Now, when I say that, I mean, would you speak that, what a cowardly person to a patient suffering from cancer? No, you won't. You'll show empathy. You'll show compassion. You'd feel sorry. Unfortunately, because depression is something that you can't see, it's not tangible, we feel it's all in your head. And so because when people are having suicidal ideation, where the ideas of suicide are originating, we, we start thinking they're not strong enough. How can you cry about something so small? But we, just because we can't see doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So we need to look at that differently. We need to look at the science. We need to understand that this is coming from a place where their wiring in their brain is different. 
And the moment you understand that, you look at it from a different angle. Then you look at it from compassion. So I, I f feel hurt knowing that somebody who has suicidal ideation or who tries to commit suicide can be actually penalized because it's not in their control, guys. It's so no. It's like penalizing somebody who is suffering from cancer. It's that bad. It's like asking a paralytic guy to walk, and if he can't walk, we jail him. It's as serious as that. So I wish somewhere someone is listening and would change that. And I it's even it. sadder to think that there are people that have faced the term for wow. attempted suicide. That makes no sense. And if, if I can now move on to, to the question, uh, Mr. Mr. John, would you like to tell, would you like to shed some light um, based on, on the Kenyan law, you know, how, what are some of the measures that you think can be taken to guarantee um, mental and psychological aid when under the sentence? Because apparently, if you are under the sentence, you are supposed to be taken to a rehabilitation institution. But that's just about as far as we know. So what, what, what do you kindly shed some light on, 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 on that? So uh, yeah, thank you. Like you mentioned, uh, attempted suicide is crime in Kenya under section 226 of the penal code. And it is punishable for, you know, you're jailed for two years, but not in a prison, but actually jailed in Madari Mental Institute for two years and you also pay a fine. So you can get both. Uh, but I think it's where we, we are coming from as Kenyans and also Africans. You know, in our African language, uh, mental health has one word. I don't know if there is a language here that has more than one word for mental health. It was not divided like in English, where you have PTSD, ADHD. They don't divide them like that. They just call True. you one word, Mondawazimu. True. So, uh, and Mondawazimu has a, a very bad connotation. Uh, where you, you are mad, you have lost your mind. And uh, I think we need to do a lot of uh, sensitization to the general public on issues mental health, especially during this time. Uh, let's take this thing to policy level, where you see the same way we are, we, are, we are rallying behind COVID. We are testing everyone and we are vaccinating everyone. After COVID, the next pandemic will be mental health issues. Mm -hmm. People, a lot of people will be depressed. Mm -hmm. A lot of people will be, you know, have a lot of mental challenges, anxiety. You know, living in Kenya, even before COVID was hard, even before COVID, uh, if you check uh, the statistics for mental health issues before COVID, they're already high. They said one in every 10 Kenyans was depressed. Now imagine what has happened during this one plus years that we have had COVID. And so also for mental health, uh, like she has said, why, why would you punish someone who is sick? Like why would you take someone who is sick to jail? Uh, I understand where the government is coming from. I was talking to one lawyer and they were telling me the reason why it is an offense is to discourage people from attempting suicide. But I was telling him someone who wants to die uh, has you know underlying issues. There's a root cause, and that is what we need to address, so that we don't get to a place where someone wants to kill themselves. And if it is a health issue, then it needs to be treated. Uh, another thing is also just how we, just how our mental health institutions are. I am a patient at Madari. I have ADD, so I take counselling and all that from Madari. I used to go to another expensive hospital, and I could not afford. So I said, let me use this government institution. It's quite affordable, but it is dilapidated. Mm -hmm. The queues there are unending. You can stay in a queue for up to six hours, and you find people tied with ropes, and people are being beaten, and people are pinned down, waiting to be seen by the doctor. So just how we treat people with mental health issues is, is you know, it's very sad. It's a sad state. And we need to address this issue so that the story about how we treat people with mental health issues changes. Also just insurance. I don't know how many insurance companies cover mental health issues. Like if you can go to, you see the way you would go to a general physician and the insurance will cover. I don't know of insurances that would cover when you see a psychiatrist or a psychologist. So just how the policy around mental health is, uh, is where the challenge is. So even as we have this discussion, Let's talk to the policymakers and ensure that 
the laws of Kenya are changed to such a way that they will accommodate mental health issues. Because if we don't, after COVID, then the rates of suicide will go up. Um, in 2019, 325 people committed suicide. Now that's confirmed, 325 people. And the number of those who are attempted suicide were on the higher side. And some, like you said, were actually jailed for attempting suicide. You can imagine. 300, and, and those are the confirmed ones. So what happens to the ones that are not reported? How, how many are there? And if, if I'm sitting here and thinking, for attempted suicide, I am going to be taken to Madare. I mean, if you ask anyone outside, w what does Madare Hospital deal with? They're going to tell you mad people. It doesn't have a different names. It's only just a one general name, and it can be used in any terms. You see, so any anybody says you're going madare, it's like you are a crazy person. You are a mental. There is nobody there as somebody can come and say, "Oh, Aruna, you only have a small challenge. That is ADHD only. You're not totally mental. You need just little help." To, to go through this process or come out of this condition or maybe learn how to deal with the condition you have, you see. So I understand his concern also, I understand uh, Vinny's also comments, but we are living in Africa where we have a whole community needs to be educated still. Despite the rules and regulation and all the mental health advocates are in place, but there's a lot of work needs to be done yet. It's true. It's true. And, and this is such a great initiative. We are actually extremely thankful to the Slum Code Group and our sponsors for creating a platform like this. Because this is one step ahead. This is one of many w different ways we can get closer to, just like Ms. Aruna has said, uh, sensitizing an entire community. Because Africa is large. And you might think your voice is too small, but with programs like this and events like this, we can create um, awareness. We can see the bigger picture. So thank you, thank you so much for sharing that with us. It's, it's truly disheartening, but it is encouraging to believe that, you know, soon, if not now, it's not going to be as bad. So uh, anyway, b b before I can move on to the next question, I'd like to give um, a huge thanks to the Slum Code Group and our sponsors, Montessori Plus Center, Bini Empowers, SOS Children's Village, uh, Fair Trade Software Foundation. You are amazing. Thank you so, so much for allowing to be part of a program as this. Um, it really does a lot. I mean, I can sit here and comfortably say there is so much that I'm picking up from this. Um, and I'm sure our viewers um, online are, are too because you can really see the impact of this and how it's, it's not just one person. And we are not necessarily the problem. The, I am not, my parent is not the problem. The child is not the problem. It's, it stems deeper than that. And it's important to understand and to realize how fundamental it is for us to be able to see things like this and develop. And one is through understanding, such as sessions like this. Um, if I can, I, I can move forward to Miss Serena. Are you with us? Hello. Yes, I am. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us all the way from Hong Kong. We really hope you're doing well. Um, you are the founder of Care Bear. Would you like to tell us a bit about, about Care Bear and what it incorporates? Sure. So Care Bear is basically, I'm a COVID turned entrepreneur. So a lot of things that I do right now is started from the things that I, I saw started from COVID and actually responding to what a lot of you guys were talking about, you know, policies in Kenya and how you guys have been dealing with suicide cases. And it really is heartbreaking to see how society has this stigma surrounding suicide while it is something very, very tragic. So like 
to me, that sense of connection, that sense of, you know, relatability, like you don't really need to, you don't really need the tragedy to like happen to you in order for you to understand it. And so starting a conversation is extremely important. And that's what Care Bear is trying to do to facilitate that kind of peer connection. In some sense, suicide really relates to this idea because in Hong Kong, when we have suicide cases, we do not report it on the news because there is something called the copycat effect. It means that if someone sees, oh, a peer or someone from the other school commit suicide, it is a lot more likely that someone else might like carry out the same action like a days after or like even a week. And so you have this chain effect. And that's the reason why in the policies, they actually like prevent news, art, news articles from really, really explicitly stating these articles out just because of that reason. And I think cultural wise, there are also some specificities towards suicide in a sense where in Hong Kong, there's one very specific method in which people commit suicide. It's by charcoal burning, where people lock themselves up in the room and then they would kind of like um, inhibit the air ventilation and then that's how they do it. But then in some cases, there are a lot of very specific policies that they can use in order to tackle the situation where they would maybe perhaps in that district, they would like um, stop the selling of coal. And so that would be my response to how policies are perhaps different in different countries and very specific to suicide as well. Um, but then about Care Bear, um, it's because we see that in all cases, the after effects, the measures that people take after people commit suicide. But why should we be reactive when we could in the first place take action in order to prevent it from happening? And so like, even if you do have a side and then afterwards you have these talks, like, you know, prayer groups, memories that they had with their friend who had who's now passed away the damage is already done so where care bear comes in is that during covid and when things are virtual teachers can't really understand or see the self-harming behaviors the prerequisites you know the signs that come before suicide for example there might be self-harming behavior there might be like like um, behavioral issues such as not handing in homework. And these are things that they don't really get to see when there's a class of like 40 people in a class. And so what we want to do is have like this early intervention, the early like detection of depression, especially mild to moderate um, among youth in Hong Kong. And if we talk about statistics, like even people, which is a statistic for students with depression, that would be already more than that's where the technology and artificial intelligence comes in. We would pair them up and then we would have the peer support network for them to kind of motivate each other throughout the experiences of having depression. And then at the very end, because ultimately we do want to keep the human touch, they would customize a care bear boss for each other based on the characteristics throughout the four months of knowing each other through sending each other the challenges and, you know, just knowing that there's someone by your side who is going through the same experiences as you are. I think that is the most comforting thing and that's the most humanistic and down to earth thing that we can provide for them, especially during COVID times. And so that is a little background about Care Bear. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. That is actually such a beautiful um, step uh, to try and still be in touch with people. I mean, like just at the beginning of the conversation, we're talking about how students at this moment are really going through it. I mean, with online school and excessive amounts of homework and just the constant pressure of wanting to be able, you know, to still get through it. Keba is, that is such a good initiative. Thank you so much, Ms. Serena, for sharing this with us. And that is actually... I don't know if it would be right to say that is almost um, some sort of therapy. Would it be to say that that would be a bit form of therapy? Aside from that, moving on to, so that's a solution, moving on to a bit leaning towards, inclining towards that conversation a bit more. But how would you say, uh, this, this one is very, very out there. What, what kinds of, of, of therapy would you would you say are beneficial or are very close to that an individual can start with, you know, as, as a personal thing? I would like to say there's so much available on the net right now. If you go to, to any, even if you go to Google, you'll be surprised how many advertisements come where they say that, you know, if you need help. There's so many apps that are available today uh, that you can scroll through on your phone and see for mental health. There are 
helps available where you can download that app and you can talk to someone. Uh, most importantly, uh, you definitely need help, number one. Right. Uh, number two, reach out to a therapist. Ask your parents, especially if you're a child, ask your parents to reach out to a therapist. You'd be surprised I have 16 year olds reaching out to me on their own, finding my number and saying, hey, I think I need help. Boys. Oh. Boys. I call them my heroes because it tr takes tremendous amount of courage to look up to someone and say, hey, I need help. Something is not OK. Right. That's the first step. The moment you've taken that step, the rest is easy. Because once you've taken that step and your parent has heard you, right? I have seen a whole 360 degree shift in parents when I tell them that your child is self-harming and I show them proof. The same parent who's probably skeptic and resistant turns around and says, what can I do? How can I help? Right? So um, the first step is to say, I need help. And then everything else can be arranged on Zoom, on online, on app-based. And then there are therapies. There is CBT. There is, you know, there are varied other therapies that are available. Mindfulness-based stress reduction therapy. So yeah, I rest my case there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And and yeah, online is our biggest bet right now. We can still get help, yeah. even even if it is uh, online. Uh, if if we can move to uh, the, an educational the educational uh, sector where we have Miss Aruna, where you are the managing director of Montessori, and t tell us a bit about Montessori's way of of teaching. Um, Montessori method is mostly of religiously method which we follow. Yeah. Um, if I put a little bit more comment when I say religiously, once you put a method in a place, a belief is also takes big role in it. It could be any method, I will say, but I because I'm a Montessorian, I believe more in a Montessorian. It gives you more fosters and it gives you un like it gives you more independence kind of pers person. So let's say when we deal with the younger children. As a mother, if a child is keep falling, what do we do? We try to protect the child. Do you think is the right parenting? I ask all the parents, ask yourself. If child is wants to try something, I know there is a limit to the to try something and you know that there's a limit where there is a danger. But a falling child, it's not a dangerous. A trying child something to test. It's not dangerous. You can't limit a child then. The child itself is potential. It's very observant. We just talk about the teenagers and above. On dinner table, the conversations are essential. What you're talking as an adult, you have to be also careful. Where are you talking? Don't bring everything on the table. You know who is your listener. Who are the observant mind? So same thing happens in educational system also. Do not conflict once you have a trust in a system. You follow the methodology. You empower a child with the system and with the courage. And support the child. Again, when I say support the child, do not put the boundaries to the child. Say, you need to be a doctor. Whoa. A child who is six years old, you are already saying, need to be a doctor. What kind of perspective you are putting in front of a child already? See, this is where also one of the points where suicide cases can go up. I'm failing. I can't be a doctor. I'm going to let my parent down or my parent will look down on me. Trust in your child. Encourage your child. Your child has a potential. They all have a uniqueness of it. Treasure that uniqueness. Not everybody can be a doctor. Not everybody can be a teacher. Or not everybody can be a scientist. Right? Everybody has their own uniqueness and they all have to treasure it. To treasure this in a child through the method of education and through the belief in a child, I'll say <laughs> it brings yeah, more potential to it. Yeah? So as an educationalist, I will say, if your child is learning something very basic, 
go to your child level and learn do not judge that you are an adult and you know everything right yeah if 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 a child mind is thinking i'm sad because i'm feeling sad but i don't know why but if parent don't feel that sadness or don't want to understand you're already overlooking one task do you think that child will come back to you and look for that help no plus as we just talked about the conversation on table if you don't allow a smallest person to speak you will not able to receive what the child wants to say respect the child yeah and through the education of montessori this is what we discover each time we don't put boundary in front of the child and say or a target to the child and say you must finish this you must know this so as educator also you have to, to play a big role in each part i wouldn't say only with the child sometimes we have to work with the parent too right now the parent who already has a mind frame that my child needs to learn certain level of education until he finish 6 years in this school do you think that's right on child do you think that's right on a teacher right you are over judging the situation and you are already giving up on the process so through this method or through any other educational please trust the process once you give your child to educationalist you have to be part of that whole process so same thing happens when we look at the, a, any mental health i go to hypothetical if i have to go to the my therapist but what if my family don't believe in therapy they keep saying to me no you don't need this we just talked about madare right there is two different there is a gap between what is madare what madare is doing and what people believing in madare so you have to fill that gap also say no you are not mental you need a help you are a human you have a emotion where you have to speak so through this montessori method we do get to get overcome with these kind of small small challenges but we unfold as it comes we don't judge something we let the child come up with the say oh i have interest today to do mixing colors we let the child do this is only children who wants to be bloom out there and show their talent as earlier we said you have to treasure it you can't put something in a child which child does not have it so through this method we try to treasure this small small uh, uniqueness in a child but whole in one we respect the child whatsoever the age is whatsoever the circumstances we do have to respect the child in every aspect Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And we can all agree that is such a beautiful approach to you know how to deal with with children even at the tender age so that they can still grow and be holistic. <laughs> um uh before we can we can we can wrap up. We have uh one more question, but this one is for the audience. We would love for you to interact with us and um It's it's a very open-ended question and it's something to to really think about because we've had the conversation here. What more can we do? So how can we take this conversation to probably even a policy level where we can still have you know if if mental check-ins have to be done you know just like the way Mr. John shared with us after covid we have another pandemic for mental health. So how can we be able to take this to a convert to a policy level where we can have ideas coming in on how to still constantly check in with ourselves with with family members, maybe links we can get to be reaching out to therapists just as has been discussed. Share with us uh communicate with us on our social medias at the slum code group on facebook and instagram and maybe our panelists can share the 
social media handles as well and also the blogs that they would like us to reach us out on, you can just kindly share. It can go around and you can share with us. We can start with, with Caroline. Okay, uh, on Facebook, it's Carol Murugi Mugambi. Um, on Instagram, it's Carol. Yeah, let's share and let's, let's interact. My account's name is Lara Marie. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Feel free to reach out and also to my WordPress account, staygrace at wordpress.com. Yeah. My account is Bini Empowers as one word on Instagram. Uh, I'm on YouTube for especially for adolescents going through anything to do with school pressures, exam pressures. I have series of videos, uh, five minutes, less than five minute videos, which would instantly put things in perspective for you. So you can follow me on YouTube, uh, on Facebook. I'm on Bini Brahmbar Sharma. Uh, and yes, uh, keep chatting. Let's the engagement keep running. One of the most important things I'd like to share with everyone here is that I very strongly believe that we are already on that path. The fact that we are discussing here, the fact that we are having panelists here, the fact that we are having a live event, uh, I think we're already on that road now. What we need to do is we do not ever need to look at the numbers. We don't need to look at whether we have 10 in an audience, one in an audience, or 1,000 in an audience. We just need to keep doing what we are doing on an everyday basis. Because every life you make an impact with, every life you speak to this about, every parent that you talk to this about, this topic especially, that parent may agree or not agree, that child may agree or not agree, but they may go home thinking differently. And the next day they'll try and share the same message with someone else. So I would remind each of us here to take a pledge that let's, let's work small. Let's do it every single day. Let's make a commitment that we won't go to bed without talking about this to at least one person. Right? Thank you very much. Thanks. So my uh, social media account, uh, on personal base, I'm Aruna Varsani. So I am on Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, and I am on Facebook. But when it comes to reach to the school method, which I use for Montessori, um, you can reach out to me on Montessori Plus Center at gmail.com or same name with the Facebook page and Instagram page. Thank you. Uh, on Facebook, I'm John Paul Odiambo. On uh, Twitter, at Odiambo Obat. Chanuka on Facebook is Chanuka Association. On Twitter, it's at chanuka.org. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Ms. Rani, can you hear us? Yes, now I can, yeah. Uh, yeah, we were, we were speaking concerning Care Bear and, you know, the how things are run back in, in Hong Kong. What, what alternative methods of therapy would you say are either being implemented or are working out on your end to still provide care and assistance to victims of depression and anxiety? Actually, a lot of the things that you guys mentioned just now has a Actually. lot to do with, you know, depression and anxiety, and it's already been proven to be really, really effective. And like, we already know that like 70% of symptoms of mental disorders exhibit themselves by the age of 17, as like we mentioned just now. And definitely, like if we start early from can help help like them to alleviate some of the symptoms that they have way before it really inhibits it becomes like a mental health disorder and so try it that sense of helplessness worthlessness helplessness that people with depression they go through and it really like inhibits their way of thinking in a sense where they have a lot of negative negative self-thought um they take themselves in a sense where they blow a lot of like negative ideas out of proportion. And especially during COVID-19 because um, of online schooling, a lot of their emotional buffers, for example, hanging out with friends, going out and doing social activities, a lot of it has been lost because of the way that things are right now, the new normal as we call it. Um, on top of that, it's also like the blurred boundaries between work and home as well, because the way, the where, the place where you work is also the place where you live with your family. And it's supposed to be also the place where you rest. And so like with all of that, you don't really get to distinguish yourself when is work, when is play, when is time to go and study and all of it's like really like um, messes with their heads quite a bit. And so especially if these days you were to tell them about all oh, resilience, about really being positive or being your best self, it isn't like the way that 
it could really appeal to them because it's no longer the reality that they're living in. However, what we can do is like to ask them to, as someone mentioned just now, to make the most of the situation that they do have. And of course, like regarding therapy, we do have like cognitive behavioral therapy where we identify and challenge unhealthy cognitions and thoughts, solution focused therapy, you know, where they have a clear outcome of what mental health, like what, what they want to work towards and the good professionals help them work towards that goal. And we also have family therapy where as the names of, we try to understand the whole demographic whole dynamics between the youth themselves and their parents as well as people the teachers and social workers in school as well and so yes all of these do work and of course right now we do have mindfulness expressive art therapy a lot of these other methods that really really tie into you know understanding the self family to what can be done as a in general. And so it's not just the issue of one person. Mental health disorders is not just the health of one singular individual. It's a lot of combinations of how they interact with society, how they interact with their own thoughts as well. And so it's a lot more. However, what I do want to touch upon are the four aspects of how we can facilitate that change. Because obviously positive like like positivity in itself, it's easier said than done. We could all we could always tell someone, oh, be happy, be cheerful, but it doesn't work that way, right? So I think the best way to do it would be through engagement and through influence. And you know, obviously, with how COVID has affected the way that we do things right now, we do have to move with the times and try to engage, like, and add into like the equation more aspects that could possibly it could be risky, but at the same time, it could possibly add to it. It takes a lot of experimentation. Psychology is all about data. It's all about empirical evidence and community service. Like on top of everything, we have social impact assessments, which I will talk about later on, but. I think the first one, the most important thing is to start from speaking the language of the youth. How do we do that? So obviously we have a lot of initiatives where it is by youth for youth. So we invite youth onto the panel and we take their voices seriously and really like listen to what they have to say. Just now, a lot of us have mentioned, bring them to the dinner table, listen to what they have to say. R mutual respect is something that is very crucial for the dynamics between parents and child. Yes, I, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, Cause personally I am a youth ambassador and advisor for a lot of the NGOs in Hong Kong. And what we do is we start a conversation about mental health you know randomly go up to their child and be like okay let's talk about your deepest darkest secrets they would be like really taken aback at the very beginning they'd be like whoa mom you never really understood me like why what are you doing right now why are you trying to understand me all of a sudden and so by starting with perhaps like older brothers and someone whom they can relate to and perhaps you know, they can serve as a role model they can look up to they would be more receptive of the idea a lot more so if I were to tell them, oh, mental health is very important, you've got to take care of yourself, to them, this would be more of something more caring compared to what a teacher would say to them, just because the people might have. And so that's peer support comes in and peer counseling. Peer counselors, they go through, they know what teenagers are going through because they're going through it themselves. And to me, a, lot, a very core value of mine is that you know what others are going through because you're going it through them through it with, with them together. So you're their partner, you are their companion throughout the entire experience. And that's how they know they're being supported. And that ends my first point. And onto the second point is how do you tap into the teenager's strengths? How do you find out what they want to do and how are you gonna facilitate that process into meeting that goals? Obviously, if you tell them to choose what they want to do for the rest of their lives when they're in secondary school and they're in high school it is nearly it's no it's, it's rarely accurate because if you were to ask me when i was 17 years old what i wanted to do i wanted to be a dietitian i wanted to be a vet i wanted to be everything and now i'm in psychology who knew i would be in psychology so i think just now also one of the speakers also mentioned society has a very very one-dimensional way of defining what a good and successful child is and it's rarely the case like normally we would only credit and acknowledge what a child has earned like what the achievements that they've had in school the extracurricular activities the prizes that they won and it makes it seem like a lot of the validation has to be earned and it's become a lot no love that parents should be giving their children and so in order to reinforce that in order to like change that dynamics like achievements don't have to be conventional like um 
I'm actually like, I would do volunteer work outside where I would interact with a lot of triad members in Hong Kong. A lot of them are just 15, 16 year old kids and they don't know what they want in life. And I asked them like, why are you in a triad? Why are you coming out late at night? Why aren't you at home? Sometimes they answer me by saying, my parents don't care about me. Sometimes if I go home late, they lock the doors and they don't let me go home because you know it's past bedtime. And so what they do is they go on the street brothers of the triads they'd be like oh you're one of us now they would give them that sense of belonging that they never got from home and that is the one of the reasons why it's not about peer pressure it's not anyone forcing them into this wrong influence into this wrong crowd but it's because they give them that sense of belonging and that pride of belonging to a group that really lures them in and what we do is that they we try to like tell them like what do you really want to do oh, your hobbies are playing darts, cool, come to our center, we'll teach you how to become a professional dart player, we will have the best trainers teach you just how to play darts, and then they would, because they love the game, they really enjoy it in their free time, they would come and just play darts with us, and sometimes they would play pool, it could be street dance, esports, e-gaming, so as long as we recognize their talents and provide them resources, there has got to be a way for them to tap into it and really develop their sense of self, and so that is about tapping into their strengths. And last but not least, it's about technology. Um, at the APA convention 2020, there was out of the three days of the convention, one particular day was about the toll that COVID had and ways that we can you know, do to like counteract it, to really move forward from it. And a huge focus of it is on technology and telecounseling. It is about interconnections of psychology and technology and in Care Bear, like we're doing an application. We're also trying to tap into that human touch as well has to be it's youth focused and has to be because there are other apps out there that really help you regulate your breathing it helps you calm down however for us if we're targeting teenagers who have depression they're already they don't have the motivation like two of the main things like loss of motivation and loss of interest and so if they already have these traits if i tell them to calm down even more if i tell them to take breathing exercises it might not tap into the specificity of like depression itself what we want them to do is to have the smart goal framework to have specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely goals where we could obviously tap into their strengths and go through that thing. You can't go from unmotivated to motivated at this at one go. But what you can do is like give them small achievable steps. It can't be too easy, like, oh, wake up one day or like drink a cup of water. At the very beginning, that might be some stages that we might go through, but ultimately at the end, we want them to be able to reach that threshold, that idea that they can function as a normal person, or they can get that sense of motivation to at least power them through their academics, get them to where they want to be. And at least that would be like, give them a sense of self they, that they don't feel like a sense of failure. It's kind of like a reinforcement thing where, you know, at first, oh, it's because they don't have the motivation, they can't do things at school. But if we do give them a bit of that sense of motivation, starting from themselves as an individual, perhaps a lot of that motivation can transfer into their work at school as well. And so that's how the SMART framework works. And so to wrap things up, you know, a lot of things has to be measurable. You have to carry out a lot of social impact assessment because a lot of things that I said just now, it's very qualitative. We do have to analyze what works and what doesn't. It takes a lot of trial and error, especially with technology. And it's very, it's very nice right now that a lot of other like, there's a lot of collaborations, you know, between Slum Code and Care Bear and all of you guys, like a lot of brilliant minds when it come together, this is how like a lot of the synchrony and a lot of the collaboration works and that's where ideas come from. And involvement of corporates these days, them wanting to contribute to the UN sustainability goals and encouragement of innovation and, and creativity, design thinking, entrepreneurships. Like I wouldn't have expected myself to be in this position right now if it wasn't for a lot of the path that a lot of like the elders have paid for me. And take young voices seriously. Generation Z is, a, is like a force to be reckoned with and their voices do matter. And so um, to end it off with a quote, I think for all of us, for a lot of teenagers out there, I really connect with the phrase that, you know, choose a corner of the world and use your gifts to make it better. You don't have to be the next Elon Musk. You don't have to be the next Steve Jobs. Just find what you have, find whatever you like doing, and then develop on it. You know, you, you can do what you set your mind to do as long as you persevere and use some grit and resilience. So thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Ms. Rim, for sharing that with us. That was extremely lovely. And we can all agree that that truly was, was motivating. It, it was important. And we're looking forward, we're really looking forward to 
the building of Care Bear and how it will continue to impact each and everyone, one brain at a time. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks for having me. With that being said, thank you so much for, for being with us. I'd like to give a special thanks to the panelists. Thank you for having this session with us. Thank you, viewers, for being with us throughout the session. It was extremely informative and incentive and necessary. Uh, I'd like to thank our, our, our sponsors, that is Care Bear, Ms. Ms. Serene. Uh, I also would like to thank Chanuka Association. Thank you so much as well. Tech Mits Music, we are extremely grateful. Kamau Kamau, you have done um, an amazing job with us today. Thank you so much. Volume Culture, as well as Future Mits Friday. We are extremely grateful for partnering with us, with the Slam Code Group, to be able to create an opportunity like this one. And with that, I would like to give uh, way for the next agenda of the day. But thank you so much for staying in touch with us. And now we are going to move into the next segment, which is the question and answer session between our audience and the panelists. But before we move into that segment, allow me to give a great thanks to our sponsors for being a part of this conversation and the event for making this happen. Bini Empowers, thank you so much. Thank you to Chanuka Association as well, Montessori Plus Center, we are extremely grateful, and SOS Children's Village. We are extremely grateful for you having been part of this today, and we look forward to even more. With that being said, let's move into the question and answer session. Thank you. I would agree to a research like that uh, and reason being that any kind of uh, mental health disorder okay uh, immediately uh, construes in stress right uh, obviously I think uh, all of us uh, should be aware that stress is also the origin of um, uh, a lot of uh, physical illnesses uh, and also anyone who um, I mean there's a there's a whole um, research based on it that there's something known as telomeres you know which is our end of our uh, DNA um, uh, part of our DNA chromosomes now people who are extremely stressed uh, their tel uh, telomeres are really small okay I know I'm getting a bit technical here um, uh, but hear me out so people who are extremely stressed their telomeres are really shorter in length Okay, what does shorter telomeres mean? Shorter telomeres uh, actually showcase uh, that how um, uh, rapidly you are aging. So it's it's so um, interesting that even people who say, for example, um, survived uh, wars, and if those mothers are carrying uh, children around that time, that child's telomeres would be shorter than compared to any other infant's telomeres. Right, because that child has actually gone through the level of stress that the mother went through when in that um, you know uh, infancy stage. So uh, yes, I agree that uh, people who are dealing with mental health um, uh, disorders uh, would definitely be aging rapidly. You know, uh, I didn't know about five years, but I would agree to that. Um. I will still say the, what I said earlier in my channel that we have to trust into the process and take to the child with a holistic approach. So that is where my confidence sits right now. And when he said mental health, you're already winning that little bit of a percentage of the health because you are being a part of conversation. You are being part of sharing your emotions. You are being part of uh, being uh, in educational field also. So this is where the couple of fields where we have compiled together and be uh, a teamwork. This is how we're going to win or support the mental health through the educational system. Um. Definitely more harm than good because from if I were to just look at social progress more about just the internet boom that happened, uh, I believe that it has its own advantages. But the biggest disadvantage is that somebody sitting 
uh, somebody as a, as as young as a seven eight year old can actually chat with anyone around in the world. Like how crazy scary is that? Uh, I also believe that our generation of parents, um, uh, we did not get um, uh, you know this whole uh, internet uh, thing while we were growing up. Uh, however, uh, while it came in, uh, you know, somewhere in our twenties. So today, when our children are usually on their phones, we cannot even guide them as to the pros and cons of um, uh, you know uh, networking on the internet or networking on the social platforms because we are not aware of it. So I think it definitely uh, requires a lot more in-depth understanding on how it works psychologically at every level, at every age uh, space. Uh, to even understand that, um, how can we balance it out? I'm not saying don't be on your socials. I'm just saying that we need to understand the pros and cons of it. So yes, it has caused quite a lot of harm because people, most often than not, are always uh, adults, children, you know, are always on their phones because adults are on their phones because dining table conversations are replaced by uh, screen one-on-one -on -one screen screen conversations. If I may say. So a little, little bit more additional to Muniz's uh, uh, comments. Yes, the social impacts are, are very important. It does impact, even if we say outside the screen screen time, where you're sitting, it matters. With whom you're sitting, it matters. Where you're taking your, 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 how do I say, your, let's say if it's a child, where are you taking this child? Is, is it the correct place for the child? Is it the right place for the child? Because remember, also, when we go socially, we get busy carried away with our age social. We don't realize what's what happening to the surrounding who we are carried with us. It could be a six-year-old child who is maybe listening to the conversation of, about uh, alcohol. See? So it's important to have a conversation mm -hmm. and also overlook where the social uh, event or social taking place. As a, as a parent, as an adult, as a, as a individual so yes it's the screen time is one ex uh, one place and another one is could be a dinner table or could be a gathering or a social where you are in a in a bigger number so you have to be very alert exactly you're taking with you when you're going is this the correct place is it the right uh, conversation happening for your person or for your child which you have carried or you're taken with you yeah so it's it's all about be very alert and like be 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 watch out. Be watch out. Watch what where it is. Who you are. Where you are. Thank you so much for that session. And now we will move into art showcasing by the Slum Code Group, SOS Children's Village, and Montessori Plus Center, as well as therapeutic activity done by Phyllis Wanja and Albert Nashan.
Hello guys, I'm Solomon Ojalo, the hub manager at the Slum Code Group. And I would like to thank everybody who joined us for this amazing uh, event. Um, we thank you uh, for the amazing interactions that we had on social media. Um, the panel discussions, you guys uh, joined through and asked questions uh, to make uh, the event what uh, it has been today. I would like to extend uh, uh, gratitude to the sponsors that we had throughout the event, uh, <clears throat> Montessori Plus Center, uh, SOS Children's Village, uh, Chanuka Association, and uh, Bini Empowers for making all this a success. And also to our partners who joined us uh, throughout to also make this event a success, uh, Volu Culture, Tech Meets Music, Kamau Kamau, uh, and Future for Fridays, and uh, finally, Afyakili. We thank you so much, guys, for supporting us throughout the, uh, the planning of the event to make it um, a success. Um, we thank you so much, and we look forward to having more interactions and more events uh, that will help us discuss on matters mental health and uh, see what the possible solutions that people can come up with to help people become mentally stable in the future. We thank you so much for joining, and I'll see you when you see me. Bye. Pa tu 